Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you know that um, I have to be grateful because it doesn't happen often that uh, people invite a philosopher to speak about such topics. Uh, it shows that uh, we have big problems. Uh, there are normally two stages in life when you do philosophy. When you're very young, you ask the big questions, uh, why the sky is blue, and uh, when you're very old and the end is near and you ask uh, what's on the other side. Uh, in the middle, uh, unless there are big problems, philosophy doesn't get that much attention. So I just perceive that uh, perhaps uh, we can do some bit of philosophy today. And because we have only 15 minutes, um, this is going to be uh, speed dating uh, with philosophy. I do hope it will lead to a long-term relationship, but if not, at least you will have enjoyed a few minutes. Um, now, um, because the time is short, uh, I will introduce just a few ideas, uh, and uh, just using a different analogy, this is going to be more an appetizer than anything else. The three ideas are hyperhistory, infosphere, and fourth revolution. Slides will follow. The three ideas should help us to frame some of the issues, uh, interesting issues that have been discussed uh, in the morning or for the past few years in the newspapers. The pressure that is mounting on us in terms of the impact that ICT is having on our lives as we speak and on future generations. I will end with a proposal just to make sure that uh, I don't just raise sort of uh, concepts and issues, but I'm also contributing to the uh, good of the whole uh, uh, company, and that proposal will uh, go under the label of infraethics. So here is uh, the first idea, and for the historians among us, forgive me, this is going to be very, very elementary. Um, you have prehistory uh, roughly 6,000 years ago. It means any stage of human life when society doesn't have any ICT. You cannot record the present for future consumptions. That normally means no writing, but it could be anything else. And there are perhaps a couple of villages still uh, down there in Brazil which live in prehistory. So that's the prehistory for the historian. Now, you move from prehistory to history once you uh, get the uh, writing or any other ICT uh, going. And that means uh, that uh, from ICT you move to a society where individual and social well-being are related to ICT. Uh, Roman Empire, British Empire, no, no ICT of that kind, uh, no empire. However, you're still not relying entirely on ICT. That's what happens when you move to the third stage. Once the individual and social well-being becomes entirely or largely dependent on ICT. Now that's quite a simple concept. It means that any society against which you can wage cyber war, that is a hyperhistorical society. Its well-being depends on ICT to the extent that you can actually affect it by no, uh, affecting their infrastructure. That is the kind of hyperhistorical uh, society in which we already live now. And that's the first uh, idea. The second idea, and that was about time. So time is hyper-historical. That's what we're dealing with. That's why we feel that uh, all these ICT and big data are making a big uh, impact on us, obviously. We are sitting on them for our well-being. Clearly, the thing on which we sit is so crucial. Space. Mm -hmm. So that's quick introduction to our time. As far as space is concerned, um, there's been a long debate now fading away between two different kinds of AI. AI, artificial intelligence, was meant to be engineering. As long as it does what it's supposed to do, I don't care whether it's really intelligence. Or cognitive science. No, it has to be the real thing. It has to be the wet brain, but done uh, in a non-biological way. Meanwhile, that's 50 years of debate in five minutes. But meanwhile, what was happening is that we were changing the environment to make sure that our stupid, trust me, I know this computer, stupid technology was able to work in the new environment. So instead of developing, because we could not, intelligent, really intelligent applications, we changed the environment to make it fit to the stupidity of our machines. Now this is something that we can call, with a technology uh, terminology, enveloping the world. An envelope is in industrial design the 3D space within which a robot can successfully work. Now, who would be so insane as to build a robot and unleash that robot down the street and say, build me a car? You build a whole environment around that robot and that environment is successfully you know, able to provide the robot with the right interactions. Here's a simple example from home. 
uh, that's one of my favorite machines. It took me years to get the right uh, to buy one. So I, I was the one who was doing the dishes. Uh, that is enveloping for you. That machine has a whole environment, if you want to be fancy, it's called ontology, but no, that's what it is. It's a box, and you have very silly things inside. I did not wash dishes that way, trust me, but that's the way the machine does it. You build a whole world around the stupid abilities of that thing. This is a stupid idea. The stupid idea here is to build a robot, remember, who does the dishes as I do them, not exactly what we want. This is the future is a robot that puts the dishes inside the machine. And that's what I want. <laughs> so you get, uh, uh, you get the idea of the infosphere. Now, um, out of metaphor, this is what is happening right now in Brussels. This is from the Digital Agenda for Europe. Uh, you can read um, more than 20% of European citizens throughout Europe use a laptop to access the internet via wireless away from home or work. Think about it. Where are they? Are there? And what is out there is a world has been enveloped in such a way that the wireless works out there. So we're transforming the environment to make sure that we can work within it and our machines can work within it. So here is what has happened. Uh, that's grandma. Mm. Uh, grandma uh, used to walk inside a, a room where the computer was the room. No, she just was surrounded. Even before, she used to change software with a screwdriver. Mm. Uh, nobody here remembers that. Right? No, that's good. Uh, that's the, her daughter. She walked out of the room and the computer became something that was in front of her. And that is her granddaughter. She's back inside. Her environment is a wireless environment where uh, robots and artificial agents and human agents are interacting. And that's the infosphere within which we all are working, certainly here in Brussels. This is going to be more and more the case in the future. So that's enough for space. So hyperhistory as far as time is concerned, infosphere as far as space is concerned. What about us? What does it all mean for us, me, my children, my wife, my family? And here is uh, even more simplifications. And now it's time to uh, ask forgiveness to the philosophers and intellectual in, in the room. The shallowest way of analyzing knowledge, science, technology, is to say that it makes a difference to our understanding in two basic ways. One is obvious. It's about the world, dude. Of course, of course it is. It's telling us, uh, in a sort of extrovert way, how we can understand and interac interact with the world. But indirectly, it's also about us. And I'm not talking about social science. I'm not talking about anthropology or psychology. I'm talking about the hard sciences. Sometimes the hard sciences tell us indirectly a story about us. And that's why we are witnessing what I like to call a fourth revolution in our self-understanding. You know the first three. We used to be at the center of the universe, and it was a very comfortable position. Uh, uh, unfortunately, no, uh, Copernicus came and said, sorry, humanity, you have to move over. You're not at the center of the universe. So we retrenched after the first revolution and decided that, well, at least we were at the center of the biological game. And Darwin came and says, um, I'm afraid you're not at the center of the biological game either. Uh, move over. So we retrench a third time. He says, well, we are at least rational human beings in control. We know exactly what's going on in our minds, etc." And then Freud came and says, uh-uh, bad news. You have to move over. So we have witnessed these three revolutions. And if you don't like Freud, just think of neuroscience. But basically, astronomy, biology, neuroscience have meant that our understanding of the world has told a different story about ourselves. And that's why we find them so intriguing, not just because of what they say about the world, but also because they put us a mirror in front of us. The new mirror today is computer science and ICT. It's putting in front of us a new mirror, and it's a kind of fourth revolution. It's telling us that we are not the only agents capable of rational decisions, interactions, and we are not the only things that work and live and flourish by using uh, information or data. We're just, as I write there, some kind of information organisms. You know, we heard so much about our database, our no, DNA, with some information organisms, among many others, who share with other biological and artificial agents this kind of infosphere I mentioned before. So within all this, you can see why clearly there's plenty of problems and therefore jobs for philosophers. Here is the uh, sort of clock that's been going on for the past 6,000 years. Create, collect, record, process, transmit, use, reuse, on and on and on and on, the data, until we got where we are. 
infosphere, hyperhistory, and a fourth revolution. This clock has been going faster and faster and uh, has created you know, those zillions of data that are actually making our life uh, so comfortable today. Within that context, many crucial issues happen in the infosphere, remember, this environment which we are shaping around our capacities and our technologies, are hyper-historical in the sense that our society is dependent on the good working of their infrastructure. And they include, and I just uh, take the list from our debate, privacy, data security, intellectual property, liability, data access. The list could go on, actually. So these are problems that need to be understood within that particular context. So what is the proposal? And I'm coming to the end of my 15 uh, minutes. What can be done? Well, there's one way of dealing with this, and it's the old-fashioned way. So surely we've seen this before. Surely, now this is a revolution as many other revolutions. Just check in the library, basically. Look at past solutions, as far as ethical issues are concerned, and apply them to new issues. The privacy debate is a classic. We use 19th century understanding of privacy as in sort of my house sort of privacy and apply it to my data. All those metaphors about space and boundaries and trespassing, they all come from a 19th century understanding of privacy. I find it uh, short-sighted. Think about privacy, for example, in public spaces when you buy something at a supermarket. Surely that's not my data in the sort of obvious sense in which my house is my house. So that is one way. You can just look at the past and try to shape and import from the past new solutions. Or you may decide that some conceptual design, some new thinking, some innovation uh, is required. Not necessarily uh, entirely new, but something has to uh, be done. And I put there this sort of a, a simple, oversimplified sort of connection between what needs to be done when. If you are an innovator, uh, a businessman, a businesswoman, uh, an entrepreneur, you're going to take risks. That is your job. But that's called venture capital. It's not called adventure capital for a reason. Uh -huh. And the reason is that you want to take this, those risks for a rational, well-calculated reason. So you need confidence going back to some certainties. You need to work within an environment that you know you're not going to be stabbed by at the back. Those certainties require a serious, decent legal framework, which is not going to change today and tomorrow. And that legal framework requires an ethical foundation. Because if you change your ethics, you're going to change your legal framework, you're going to change your certainties, you, are, you have no confidence, therefore no innovation. Now, I know it sounds a little bit too philosophical, but trust me, that's what you know, 25 centuries of philosophy has taught us. That's the way it works. And it works you know, for the uh, uh, business uh, crisis of the bank system all the way down to innovation. So we need some kind of ethical foundation and some examples have provided by Europe. The Data Protection Directive, General Data Protection Directive. I'm not saying these are good things. I'm saying this is the right direction in which to move. We just have to dig a little bit deeper. And I have spent too much time in Britain not to care about gardening. So here's another metaphor and I'm coming to the close of my uh, talk. When you do some gardening, as you probably know, uh, you care about the flowers. But the roots are really the matter. You don't see the roots, so you think, well, who cares? But that's where the philosophical, ethical work is done. It's a dirty work, it's under the soil, it's not seen, but it's crucial. Wrong roots, weak roots, the plant is going to die, no matter how many flowers, as we saw today, can be enjoyed and described. You can have a trillion fantastic applications if the ethical principles lying under those applications are rotten, sooner or later the whole tree is going to collapse. The customers will move to a different company, will stop using your product, will complain, will require different legislation, will put up some uh, sort of complaint and so on. Some bits of that sort of digging has to be done. And uh, here's my conclusion. We can do it. We could just uh, decide, and um, because I'm making a proposal, I'm going to use the magic word, uh, please, please, the people here who have the power to make this happen, we could move in this direction. We have done this for medical research, as the Declaration of Helsinki. We decided at a certain point that we required a set of ethical principles regarding human experimentation, experimenta experimentation at the international level. That was actually going to not just limit, but foster research. 
And that's the kind of certainty that you need in order to have the legal framework, the certainties, the confidence, etc. So we can do exactly the same for uh, Europe at uh, uh, the European level in Brussels for ICT. We could have a European Declaration of Infoethics, which would then provide the sort of framework that the previous speaker uh, was also uh, pointing towards. The sort of idea within which, well, this is what I can be expected to respect, and therefore I can take risks towards the future. I hope that this might become a reality sooner rather than later, not least because I'm afraid someone is going to do it. And it's better done in Brussels than elsewhere. Thank you.